In this short video, we're going to talk about one-to-one -one and onto transformations between general vector spaces. Now, the definitions are essentially the same as the definitions that we had when we had transformations between Euclidean spaces. So our definition of a transformation whose domain is a vector space V, whose codomain is a vector space W, is you say that it is one-to-one provided that whenever the inputs are different, their images are different. Essentially the same definition we had for Euclidean spaces. It wasn't very useful, so we found some alternatives that were um, more applicable. So for example, we said that a linear transformation is one-to-one -one if and only if whenever the image vectors are equal, then the original vectors have to be equal as well. This we found to be a little bit more useful, at least when we were doing some proofs. It didn't provide us with a great test, though, to determine if uh, a particular transformation was one-to-one. -one. But the next theorem is really what we found to be useful, and it simply says that a linear transformation is one-to-one provided that its kernel only consists of the zero vector from the domain. And remember, the kernel is a subspace of the domain. So all of the vectors in the kernel have to belong to the domain. What about onto? Well, again, essentially the same definition. We say that a linear transformation is onto, provided that its range is all of the codomain. So every vector in the codomain is the image of some vector under T. And uh, that's why we also call it a subjection or a covering. Uh, we could also think about this in terms of dimension and rank. The rank of T is the dimension of, range, of the range of T. And so if the rank of t is the same as the dimension of w, uh, then at least when w is finite dimensional, then you can say that t is on 2. Uh, we used the uh, standard matrix for the linear transformation when we were dealing with Euclidean spaces to get a lot of information. Because the uh, null space of the standard matrix was the same as the kernel, and the column space was the same as the range. Now that's not going to be true when we're dealing with general vector spaces. We're going to have to do a little bit more work because the general objects in the general vector spaces are not necessarily vectors in the Euclidean space, but whenever you talk about the null space or column space of a matrix, those are Euclidean vectors. So Again, we're going to start with a matrix representation of our linear transformation. We're going to need two bases. So we're going to have a basis for the domain, so our V space, a basis for the codomain, that's our W space. We're going to construct our matrix with respect to those uh, bases. Remember the way we do that is we find the image of each of the input vectors or the basis vectors for V and then we change that image vector into a coordinate vector. In other words we're looking at what are the coefficients on the uh, B prime basis, the basis for W. That's the uh, coordinate vector. Well once we have that matrix then we're going to go ahead and transform it to reduced row echelon form. And we'll be able to get, read the uh, null space and the column space of the matrix. So suppose that I find uh, a basis for the null space from the matrix. It's the null space of, uh, again, this matrix. It's be determined by the reduced row echelon form. Then we can go ahead and decode that. We can change it back into the objects that are in V. Each one of those vectors in the null space of T, the matrix T, has a corresponding 
object in V uh, whose coordinate vector is the vector we found for the null space. So we just have to do a decoding operation. Then those vectors will form a basis for the kernel of T. Now, if the kernel of T is trivial, um, so meaning that uh, if there's no free variables, uh, then the null space is, consists of just the zero vector. The kernel just consists of the zero vector from V, whatever that uh, object would be. And the reason why we have to treat that separately is because, remember, uh, you can't have the zero vector in a basis. So uh, when, the ba when the null space or the kernel is trivial, it doesn't make sense to talk about the basis for it. Now what about the column space in the range? Well, again, what do we have to do? Uh, we have to look at the leading columns of the reduced row echelon form, go back to the corresponding columns of the original matrix. Those columns would form the basis for the row, I'm mean, sorry, the column space of our matrix. Uh, so now to find a basis for the range, we have to decode those. We have to find objects in W whose coordinate vector is the same as those uh, vectors, those columns from the original matrix. And those decoded objects now form a basis for the range of T. Uh, again, if we have the, a special case where the range consists of only the zero vector, that's only when t is the zero transformation. t maps every vector in v onto the zero vector in w. Uh, then we just say the range consists of that set with that one vector. So let's review. We can find a basis for the null space and the column space of the matrix representation of T with respect to the given bases. Once we know the basis for the null space and the column space, then we just have to do a decoding operation for the null space, since the null space or the kernel is a subspace of the uh, domain, we'll use the domain vectors to decode the kernel vectors and or the null space vectors to get the kernel vectors. And since the range is a subspace uh, of the codomain, we'll use the basis vectors for the codomain to decode the vectors from the column space to get the vectors in the range. So let's look at an example. Here we're going between two polynomial spaces. Our input space is P3, and the output space is P2. And the formula that we're going to be using to go from the input polynomial P to the output polynomial is we'll take the sum of the derivative of P plus the second derivative times the polynomial x plus 1 and then we'll add to that 2 times the value of the polynomial when x equals negative 1. We'll use the standard powers of x as the bases. Uh, we'll have uh, from 1 to x cubed for the uh, domain, since that's p3. And we'll stop at x squared for the codomain, because that's p2. Uh, from the formula, it looks like we will need, um, let's go ahead and just call these powers of x b0 through b3, and we'll need their first derivative and second derivative. So that's easy to calculate. We're just using the power rule. Uh, here to emphasize that you know, b of x equals 0 for all values of x, we actually use z of x. As a reminder, z of x is the zero function. z of x equals zero for all values of x. All right, so here's our formula up here. Uh, what would be t of b0? Well, remember b0 is actually the constant function one. So the derivative of a constant 
zero, second derivative is zero. So all we get is the value of that constant multiplied by two, which gives me two. And remember again that this um, coordinate vector, two is the coefficient on one, zero is the coefficient on x, zero is the coefficient on x squared, and remember that the codomain is p2, so that's why we would have three components. All right, let's do the same thing with uh, b1. Remember b1 of is just the b1 of x is equal to x, so its derivative is 1. Its second derivative is 0. The value is uh, when x equals negative 1 will be negative 1, so that gives me a negative 2 plus 1, which gives me the negative 1. And again, I don't have an x term, I don't have an x squared term, that's why I have the two zeros there. All right, and so now uh, b2 of x is what, x squared, its first derivative is 2x, its second derivative is 2. So I gotta do some algebra here. It's a value when x equals one, negative one squared would be positive one. So I'll have two uh, x plus another two x plus two plus another two. So four x plus four. So I got four in the constant, four as the coefficient of x, no x squared term. So that's why there's a zero. And finally for b3, which is x cubed, its first derivative is three x squared. The second derivative is cx, so I'll have to, and then it's a value when x equals negative one would be negative one. So that would give me three x squared. Using the distributive property, I would get a six x squared plus six x, and then subtract off two. Combine the like terms, I have nine x squared plus six x minus two. So minus two as the first component, six in the second component, nine as the third component. Those are the coefficients there of our basis vectors for the codomain. All right, so now here were the coordinate vectors that I found. So I'm gonna go ahead and put those in order as the columns of my matrix. So I'm gonna have two, zero, zero, negative one, zero, zero, four, zero, zero, negative two, six, nine. I'm gonna go ahead and reduce that to, uh, or transform that to a reduced row echelon form. And from that, I can see, oh, uh, I have one free variable, that is x2, or the second column is free. And so I could sight read the vector for the null space, or I could just go ahead and find the general solution in terms of a parameter t. In either case, I get as my basis vector for the null space as positive one half, one, zero, zero. Now I'd like to decode that because to get a basis vector for the kernel of t. Now remember the kernel of t is a subspace of the domain. The domain is P3. So I expect to get a polynomial. And the way I would decode this is that the first component tells me the coefficient on one, the second component is the coefficient on x, the third component is the coefficient on x squared, and the fourth component is the coefficient on x cubed. So the polynomial that I would get would be uh, one half plus x, we'll call that n of x because it came from the null space, it belongs to the kernel, and so we could write the kernel then is spanned by that polynomial. And we can verify, uh, if we go back to our formula, remember we needed the first derivative and the second derivative. We took the first derivative plus the second derivative times x plus one, plus the value when uh, x equals negative one. So that would be a half minus one, which gives me a negative one half. And so if I mu multiply that out, I'll get a negative one plus one, which gives me zero for all values of x. So uh, that verifies that this polynomial belongs to the kernel of t. All right, what about the range or the uh, column space? So we'll need the column space of the matrix. So if we go back 
And remember that the leading columns were 1, 3, and 4. So we go back to the original matrix, look at those columns, and those will be the vectors that span the column space of the matrix. And again, if I want to get vectors in the range of t, well, remember the range of t is p2. I need to translate these or decode these into polynomials. And how do I do that? Well, remember, the first component is the coefficient on 1. The second component is the coefficient on x. And the third component is the coefficient on x squared. So that's how I get the constant function uh, 2, the linear function uh, 4x plus 4, and then finally a quadratic function 9x squared plus 6x minus 2. And I'm making the claim here that, well, first of all, by definition, then the range is spanned by those three polynomials, but I'm saying that that spans all of P2. And how do we know that? Well, that comes from the two-for-one theorem. We know the dimension of P2 is 3. And so all I need to, if I know I have the right number of vectors, all I need to do is show that they are linearly independent. And I know that this set is linearly independent because it is a set of polynomials with different degrees. And so since I have three vectors, they're linearly independent, then the dimension of this space is 3. Dimension of P2 is 3. So we can say that the uh, range is the same as the entire codomain, which means that this transformation is onto. It's not one to one because the kernel is non trivial, but it is onto. Now we really didn't have to find uh, a uh, basis for the range, um, sorry, to, uh, for the null space to say it could not be one to one. We did need to find the basis for the range to determine if it was onto. Uh, because we could just look at the dimensions. Uh, the input space has a larger dimension than the output space, and that tells me that it can't possibly be one-to-one. -one. There's just uh, the output space is simply not large enough. Uh, and so uh, the only way that we can map the entire input space is to have more than one vector in the input map onto the same vector in the output, which would not make it one-to-one. -one. And so we have that dimension theorem from uh, Euclidean spaces, and it works with finite dimensional spaces, um, that the dimension of the kernel plus the dimension of the range is going to be the dimension of the domain. Uh, so if we have, and it turns out that all we need is the following that if the dimension of the domain is finite, so if we have a finite dimensional domain, then we'll know that the kernel and the range are both finite dimensional, even if the codomain is infinite dimensional. The rank of the transformation uh, is the same as the dimension of the range of t. The nullity is the uh, dimension of the kernel. And the rank plus the nullity is going to be the that dimension of the finite dimensional domain, so the dimension of the domain. So just like with the transformations between Euclidean space, if the dimension of the domain is smaller than the dimension of the codomain, then you can't be onto because that just says you don't have enough vectors to cover the entire codomain. And on the other hand, uh, if the dimension of the uh, domain is larger than the dimension of the codomain, which is what we saw, uh, then it can't be one to one. Um, again, you have too many vectors in a sense. And so in order to map all of them to something in the codomain, you're going to have more than one vector mapping onto the same vector in the codomain.